room, uh, and many of your family members uh, have either concern about, fear about, or actual involvement with dementia up to and including Alzheimer's. As I was coming here this morning, uh, listening to uh, Texas Public Radio, our uh, NPR piece on a woman who had talked about her journey with her mother who has Alzheimer's and how when it first began, they would talk every day on the phone and her mother would tell her how her day was, tell her all that she had done. And, and as time went on, she wasn't quite able to do that, so they talked about what she made for dinner, and then she wasn't able to do that, and so she talked about her flowers, and she loved throwing flowers. And this woman could hear her mother walk through the house and look out the window and describe the different flowers by name, and color, and size, uh, and then she couldn't remember the names of the flowers, and she <coughs> asked her, well, tell me the colors. What colors do you see? And, and that went on for a little while to the point where her mother could no longer communicate by phone. And uh, it was a dramatic two-minute story uh, that too many of us are familiar with. We're going to learn a lot about not only untangling dementia, but the ins and outs of caregiving with someone with dementia. Tam Cummings, our next speaker, holds a doctorate degree, is a gerontologist, and is a nationally recognized expert and author of dementia and dementia care. She frequently advises in memory care communities for identifying various forms and stages of dementia and how to address various behaviors. A large part of her practice involves providing education for professionals as well as for family caregivers. She uses humor, we're going to find out. It's a real test here. I didn't put that in that bio before, whenever you say that, uh, the burden is on you now. It says she uses humor to carry a very gentle and personal message to help caregivers understand dementia. She's been the top-ranked speaker at more than 200 national and regional conferences. Dr. Cummings has authored a number of books, including Untangling Alzheimer's, The Guide for Families and Professionals, and The Final Year, The Final Moment. She's a member of the National Association of Gerontologists and was inducted into the Sigma Pi Omega, the National Honor Society for Gerontology in 1998. Please welcome Tam Cummings, Dr. Cummings. I didn't, I didn't put in the thing. I don't think that I said I was humorous. <laughs> I might have said I'm, I'm funny. I did get introduced once by somebody who, in the point of the introduction, somehow talked about laxatives. Was that funny? <laughs> I'm Pam Cummings. How are y'all? Good. <clears throat> Good. I got my voice back. I didn't have a voice on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I was starting to panic, but uh, I got my voice now. By a show of hands, how many are family caregivers? And how many are professional caregivers? How many are double duty? Pretty much everybody. Um, today, they've, they've locked me down to an hour and 10 minutes, and I've seen a big hook backstage, so apparently I do have to keep on time today. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what dementia is, what the major forms of dementia are, and what are the symptoms or the clinical features that differentiate one from another. The reason that we want you to know that <clears throat> is because the type of dementia determines the type of medication. The type of dementia determines whether or not your children or your grandchildren are at risk. The type of dementia determines how rapidly or how aggressive the disease will progress. And the type of dementia tells you what you're going to go through with your loved one, whether there will be expected or anticipated behavior issues that you'll need to be prepared for, whether or not you'll need to think about at times there may be a possibility of uh, treatment for a few weeks in a geriatric psych unit as part of dementia care. So those things are all normal. We'll talk about um, the stages of dementia, and then they'll throw me out of here, okay? Is that good for everybody? Everybody awake? Is that good for everybody? If you don't answer, I can't go forward. It's a strange thing. Okay? Still nobody answered. Everybody ready? Yes. Okay, wonderful. First thing let's do, let's learn how to breathe. As caregivers, your breathing gets out of balance, your autonomic nervous system gets out of balance because of the stress of caregiving. The results released just a few months ago indicate that our caregivers of people with dementia, our family caregivers, run a 67% chance of dying before the person they're doing care for. And no one was prepared for that level, that intensity, that, that kind of number. 
So it's very scary and it's very frightening. Part of being a caregiver means your stress levels are completely out of balance. We know just by what you're doing that you have the highest stress levels, the highest anxiety levels, and the highest depression levels of any group in the country. Doesn't that make you feel good? Usually when I leave the conference, people are crying. So are you all ready today? So what we're going to do first is breathe. You're going to breathe in through your nose to the count. Wait, 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 wait. wait. See, that counted as humor, so I'm off the, I'm off the, I'm good now. I'm okay to go. <clears throat> We're going to breathe in through the count, to the count of seven through your nose. You're going to blow out to the count of four. The reason we're going to count is that confuses your brain. Otherwise, your brain just goes, eh, we're breathing and doesn't care. We're going to repeat this four times, and in those four times, we will rebalance your autonomic nervous system. Your ANS runs things like upper and lower GI, blood pressure, heart rate, pulse. So it's important for you to do it. But as caregivers, professional or family, you've got to recognize what your stress levels are. Once you do this breathing exercise, you'll be rebalanced, but you're not going to stay in balance because you didn't stop being a caregiver when I finished speaking. <coughs> Learn to do this when you recognize your stressors. If it's your loved one calling out, take a second to breathe. If your loved one's in a community and when you drive up to the community, you begin to get anxious, breathe. When you leave the community, breathe. When you get up in the morning, take some time for yourself. This is 30 seconds, and you can spare that to take care of yourself. You do a great job for others. Take a few seconds to take care of yourself, because in the back of my mind is always the thought, if, if we let something happen to you, who will take care of your loved one? OK? Everybody ready? Deep breath in through your nose. Three, four, five, six, seven, blow out. Deep breath in, three, four, five, six, seven, and blow out, two, three, four. Deep breath in, three, four, five, six, seven, and blow out, two, three, four. Last time, deep breath, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and blow out, two, three, four. Everybody ready? Okay. Dementia, one of the ways to think about it is that it's an umbrella term. It's not the name of a disease, it's the name of a set of diseases. To be a dementia, the disease must be in the brain. It must be in two of the four lobes of the brain. It must be progressive, meaning that the person continues to decline. It must be terminal, meaning if nothing else happens, this will cause death. And it must interfere with the person's functioning. And so far, 48 dementias have been identified, and all of those dementias have subsets. Now, in the beginning, that sounds sort of confusing, but compare it to cancer. Cancer is an umbrella term. Cancer means that cells of the body have gone astray and are attacking the body. There are 438 identified cancers and they all have subsets. And this makes sense to you. A person can have skin cancer, but which skin cancer? They can have breast cancer, but which breast cancer? Bone cancer, but which bone cancer? Does that make sense? When you took your loved one to the physician, did the physician say to you, your person has dementia, come back in six months? And if they said that, what was your response? For a lot of families, it was, tell me when the appointment is. But what if the doctor had said the word cancer? If they had said, your loved one has cancer, what would you have said? I'm sorry? Now what do we do? Now what do we do? Would you have asked what stage is the cancer? Would you have asked, is it hereditary? Is it terminal? Is there treatment? Will there be a special place that will take care of my loved one? When we look at a comparison of cancer family caregivers and dementia family caregivers, the numbers are completely different. The average time a family cares for someone with cancer is two years. The minimum time a person, a family cares for someone with dementia is over 10 years. That right there tells you the level of stress that our families and our professionals are under. Cancer has subsets, dementia has subsets. Cancer, you automatically begin to ask those questions. What stage is it? What kind is it? Where will I go? Who will be my specialist? And who will second this opinion? With dementia, you didn't know to ask those questions, but it's the same ones. With cancer, always the chance of a miracle. Everyone here knows somebody who was diagnosed and supposed to have died six years ago, and they're still alive. In dementia, there is no miracle. And that's a hard and bitter pill for us to swallow. In measured levels of guilt, 
Family caregivers of people with cancer at the end believe that they've done everything they're supposed to do. Family caregivers of people with dementia are left with overwhelming burdens of guilt and the feeling that they didn't do enough. And that is by far the code word for family caregivers is you didn't do enough. And the reality is you do incredible levels of care. Now, people first get confused by thinking that dementia is the name of a disease when it is an umbrella term. But dementias are, are actually named, um, the word dementia comes from Philippe Pinel, who was working with a woman in 1800 in France, and that woman in a year couldn't walk, couldn't talk, didn't recognize herself or her family. And in spite of everything they did, she died. And when she died, they autopsied her brain, and her brain weighed one pound instead of three pounds and was full of fluid. Dr. Pinnell called this process demence to mean incapacitation of the mental faculties. And from the word demence, we then get the word Okay, there's a test later, so I hope we're all paying attention. We get the word dementia, but dementia is an umbrella term. Dementias are named for the physician who discovered them. Dementias are named for the cause, vascular dementia. The causation is something in the vascular system went astray. They're named for a feature of the disease, primary progressive aphasia. The feature is aphasia, the inability to use or understand language. Or they're named for the area of the brain they strike. Frontal temporal dementia strike the frontal temporal lobes. Does that make sense? These are the physicians in Germany who many of the dementias are named for. This is Dr. Uh, Pinnell. The one in the center is Dr. Alzheimer, <coughs> Dr. Wernerke, Dr. Korsakoff, Dr. Louis, Dr. Huntington. These were all German physicians who worked together at the beginning of uh, the 19th, 1900s. This is the big dementia, Alzheimer's disease. This is Alice Alzheimer and Augusta Dieter, the woman that the disease is named for. Augusta Dieter was 56 years old when her family brought her into a hospital and said she had fits of rage and jealousy. She didn't seem to understand who she was or where she was. She didn't seem to recognize her family. She had great difficulty with short-term memory, but her long-term memory was still quite effective. He asked her, for example, what her name was, and she said, Augusta. He asked her what her husband's name was, and she said, Augusta. He asked her what her address was, and she said, Augusta. He asked her what she was eating. She said chicken and cauliflower, and she was eating pork chops and broccoli. He asked her what color was the meadow. She said green. What color was the sky? She said blue. How many fingers? She said two. So long-term memory worked and short-term memory didn't. When she died, he autopsied her brain, and this is the only known picture taken of Augusta Dieter. This was taken two months before her death. She died by aspirating food into her lungs as she was chewing. Within a few days, she developed pneumonia. From there, she developed a, a decubitus ulcer, a bed sore, a wound. The wound opened, it became septic. She died of renal failure, pneumonia, and sepsis, which is considered the classic death from dementia. She's also, to me, in this picture, looks the look of dementia, that drawn and withered. If your loved one lives to the end of the dementia process, they'll lose on average one-third to one-half of their body weight. But dementia, unlike any other disease, the person doesn't look sick until the very end. And that goes against everything we know as people. If I have a cold, I look sick. If I have allergies, I look sick. If I have the flu or pneumonia, I look sick. If I have an upset stomach, I not only look sick, I change colors. My grandmother would say, you get green at the gills. I never knew where my gills were. I assumed they were somewhere back in here. Kind of like Aquaman is what I was going with. But you see here in Augusta Dieter that wasted and withered look. You see that vacancy in her eyes. For those of you family caregivers, you realized at some point that your loved one had a vacant look in their eye, and then it would be gone. As the disease progresses, the vacant look stays with occasional moments of flashes of awareness. So there's a reversal that happens in your loved one. A progression towards infancy has been described. When Augusta Dieter died, Dr. Alzheimer did the autopsy on her brain. He wrote that her brain weighed, three pound, weighed one pound instead of three pounds. The fluid that had filled her brain cavity was cerebral spinal fluid. The brain cells that were left were heavily damaged where tau protein had failed, had crumbled. Those are called neurofibrillary tangles. And the brain had a 
type of bony structure growing in it, which is plaque caused from another protein failing. Dr. Alzheimer wrote a paper about Augusta Dieter's brain, presented it at a conference. The paper was included in a medical textbook and the chapter was called Alzheimer's disease. It is not that your loved one has Alzheimer's disease and dementia, it's that your loved one has dementia of the Alzheimer's type. Does that make sense? Y'all good? Deep breath, everybody. I don't know if you really needed the deep breath. I just like waving my hands like that and having people breathe. I, I see why choir directors do what they do. It's a lot of fun. When we talk about dementia, though, most of the time we only talk about Alzheimer's disease. If we took a, a quick flash through the, through the group right now, we would find that there are people in here whose loved ones don't have Alzheimer's disease. They have other forms of dementia. You may have Lewy body. Your person may have vascular dementia or a frontal temporal dementia or Huntington's, Parkinson's, and encephalopathy. But we mostly only talk about Alzheimer's disease and the numbers that you read are on Alzheimer's disease. Those numbers are 5.3 to 5.7 million Americans have Alzheimer's disease right now. Caregivers are under tremendously high levels of stress. It's the sixth leading cause of death and it makes our caregivers at a great health risk. But they don't talk about the other dementias. If we look at the numbers for everybody right now, it's closer to 10 million Americans have some form of dementia. Dementia is the third leading cause of death in our country after heart attack and stroke. Number two is cancer. Number three is dementia. Three million of our caregivers are teenagers and pre-teenagers who go home from school and go home in the summer and take care of a grandparent or a parent. Our caregivers are at a very high risk for their own health. And it's something that we have to start paying attention to. When we look at the types of dementia, this is the current breakdown. Alzheimer's disease is the largest of the dementias. Lewy body is second. Lewy body is frequently misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's disease. Vascular dementia is third. Frontal temporal dementia is now fourth. If you're a person, a professional or a family caregiver and you're doing care for somebody under the age of 60, there's a much greater chance this person has frontal temporal dementia in some form rather than Alzheimer's disease. Next is Parkinson's. It's estimated that more than half of the people who have Parkinson's will develop Parkinson's dementia. Wernicke Korsakoff is commonly called alcohol dementia. Huntington's then you have the encephalopathies, and then you get into dementias that are very, very rare, dementias that only attra attack children. So you get into totally different things as you move into these last sets. Everybody got that? This is like the essay part of your test later on today. The word test just made everybody feel funny, didn't it? It doesn't matter how old you are. The minute someone says test, you have 57 different sphincters in your body that all went <laughs> <laughs> and some of you begin to plot your way out of here. I don't have to take a test. I'll get up and act like I'm going to the bathroom or I'm answering my phone. <laughs> there's, there's not a test. Okay. Uh, well, we can get you one. Okay, we can get you one. Yes, ma'am. The state of Texas has issued a um, criteria for making a dementia diagnosis. Y'all ready for the website? It's the longest website in the world, so you'll need an entire page to write this down. Um, is it DSHS? Uh huh. DSHS? DHSH? Which one is it? www.dshs.state, S-T-A-T-E, dot T-X, dot U-S, backslash Alzheimer's, with no apostrophe. Dr. Ronald DeVere, who's a neurologist in Lakeway, uh, and the state created the dementia criteria, and when you call up that page, you're going to get a row of PDFs. You want the third PDF. The top of the PDF has a picture of older hands. The bottom part of the PDF is an out of focus older man. So it's not your glasses, it's not your computer screen, you're not losing it, he's intentionally out of focus. This will bring up a 50 page document and the state designed this 
for a family caregiver to be able to print this out and take it to any physician and say this is the diagnostic criteria to make a dementia diagnosis. And many of you would be surprised, it doesn't take place in five minutes with a mini mental status exam. It is actually an entire series of tests. And in the criteria it tells the physician, if you've now gotten to X, now you need to go to Y. It, it guides the physician through it and it's the reason that it was developed. The um, guidelines for making a dementia diagnosis are for uh, researchers. So um, as Dr. DeVere says, nobody understands that stuff except researchers. So the state developed this form. Okay, so it is designed for you to be able to print it out and take it to a physician. Okay, are you sure? Department of Health and Human Services. Okay, she's going with DHHS. <laughs> Which one is it? DSHS. Okay, DSHS. Okay, dot state, dot TX, dot US, backslash Alzheimer's. Okay, we good to go? Okay, it is no longer does your person have Alzheimer's, it is now which form of Alzheimer's does your person have? Think back to your cancer analogy. And as you go down this road with your loved one, every time you get to a point where you don't understand what the next step is, take out the word dementia, take out the word Alzheimer's or whatever it is, and put in the word cancer, and then ask yourself, what would I do? And that will give you a very clear line of what your next step will be. Does that make sense to everybody? Three people shook their head, so I'm going to go. Earlier, younger onset Alzheimer's, this is the dementia that does strike families. This is only about 1% of the dementias, but this makes national news when a family is written about that has this lineage. Um, the early onset, onset and younger onset families, this is going to be people usually in their 20s, 30s, 40s, or 50s. This is not my 88-year-old grandmother had Alzheimer's, so it runs in our family. This is my 50-year-old grandmother died, and her brothers and sisters died, and my cousins have died. The uh, book on this is called the, the Thousand Mile Stare, and it is written by a psychologist who is one of the <coughs> children of uh, one of the famous families in our country who have early onset Alzheimer's disease. So this is a small percentage of the population, but it's very scary and it makes a lot of news. Um, Down syndrome Alzheimer's is the second one. It is recognized that people with Down syndrome will develop this form of Alzheimer's disease, but because the laws haven't been changed, people with Downs cannot be seen or taken care of in memory care. The law says that to be in memory care, the primary diagnosis must be dementia, and in Down syndrome, the primary diagnosis is Downs. So until the legislatures change those laws, in the U.S., Down syndrome folks cannot be cared for in memory care. Regular onset Alzheimer's is people in their 60s and 70s. This is the largest group of dementia. This is 50% or more of all the dementias. This is the one you march for. This is the one research is done for. Now, where people get this confused, is we now have a generation of people who with memory problems are going to the doctor, they're being proactive about it versus those of you that are still dealing with a parent and trying to figure out how to get that person to agree to go to a doctor. And where early onset gets confused with regular onset Alzheimer's is the doctor says to the family, this is early stage, and by the time the family gets home, it's become early onset. <coughs> So there's a difference between an early stage of dementia and the disease of early onset Alzheimer's. Late onset Alzheimer's is people in their 80s and 90s. Now up until about the age of uh, 65, the odds are 1 in 9. From 65 to 75, they drop to 1 in 6. By the time a person is 90, they've dropped to 1 in 2. You want the good news or the bad news? <laughs> Don't want any news at all. That's, I, I like this group. I like the way you're dealing with this. <laughs> the good news is most of you aren't going to live to be 90. The bad news is most of you aren't going to live to be 90. So it's kind of a win-win, maybe not a win-win. Okay? Um, Alzheimer's with Lewy body is now recognized. Mixed dementia is classically vascular dementia, and the person has lived long enough to now have uh, Alzheimer's as well and Alzheimer's with FTD is now recognized. Uh, the reason for Lewy body and FTD and some of the others that are mixing with Alzheimer's disease is that they're all based on the tau protein failing. They're referred to as tauopathy dementias. 
So it makes sense that if the tau protein failing causes one of these dementias, it would also cause the other and you would see those linked together in the person. Does that make sense? Lewy body is also not the name of a disease. It is again an umbrella term that means a protein that shouldn't that should live in the fluid around the cell structure of the brain, instead has moved into the cell structure and set up housekeeping. It's made a cluster in there and that is the Lewy body. It's named for Dr. Lewy. Diffuse Lewy body means on autopsy the Lewy bodies were found throughout the brain. Cortical Lewy body means they're found mainly in the cortical area. If a person has Parkinson's and has been diagnosed for at least a year and then shows the symptoms of Lewy body, the disease is called Parkinson's with Lewy body and vice versa. If they had Lewy bodies for at least a year and then are diagnosed with Parkinson's, the disease is called Lewy body and Parkinson's. So what that tells you as family caregivers is if your person has Parkinson's, you are watching for Lewy body. If your person has Lewy bodies, you're watching for Parkinson's. And it tells professionals the same thing. Now Lewy body often gets misdiagnosed and the reason for that is uh, that the family didn't realize to talk to the doctor about certain symptoms that are seen. You didn't recognize that these symptoms are the very things that are causing this dementia. Many times Lewy body is actually caught at the memory care level because the staff recognize what these symptoms are and they alert the doctor. The person has hallucinations. There are three forms of the hallucination. The most common hallucination the person has is they see images of children playing. When you come in, they will tell you the children were just here, the children are outside now, the children have been here playing. The second hallucination is the person sees animals. The animals could be that they see kittens playing or puppies playing. We live in Texas, they may see cows or horses running by. But the other side of the animal hallucination is that they have snakes in their room. They have bugs, spiders or rats crawling on them and biting them. The hallucination is so vivid to them that they will pull and tear at their skin until they tear holes in their skin and then they'll show you the wounds left by the rats or bugs or spiders or snakes. The difficult part for caregivers, the difficult part for professionals, there's nothing we can do here. Antipsychotic medication which would normally be used in this circumstance cannot be used on people with Lewy body because it causes death. So for families, for professionals, we have to go into the room and kill the snakes. We have to go into the room and beat off the rats. And then a few minutes later when the person calls out, we have to go back and do that again. Eventually this will pass, but this is very difficult for everybody to deal with, especially the person who's having the hallucination. The third hallucination involves sex. The person sees their spouse having sex with multiple people, or they see their caregiver having sex with people. Now imagine that you've been married 50 years and infidelity has never been a, an issue in the marriage. It's been a good marriage and a happy marriage and suddenly your spouse is accusing you of having sex with everyone. The real reason you take me to the doctor is you're having sex with the doctor. The real reason the mailman comes here is you're having sex with the mailman. The real reason that the neighbor comes over is you're having sex with the neighbor. The pool guy, the yard guy, the maintenance guy, any person coming in there's a sexual relationship going on. So this doesn't get discussed with the doctor. People with Lewy, body, Lewy bodies have REM sleep behavior disorder, which means when they dream they're fighting, they fight. When they dream they're running, they run. They kick and punch so violently in their sleep that they hurt their spouse or throw themselves out of bed. They have a systemized delusion that again is sexual in nature. And because of the sexual component, Many times the spouse won't discuss this with the doctor, doesn't recognize that this is a symptom of the disease, and they don't discuss it with their children. For professionals, it's a conversation you have alone with that person as to have there been accusations of infidelity. And that again is a clue for you. People with Lewy body have fluctuating cognition. They may appear perfectly lucid one moment and then very confused the next. They may appear perfectly lucid for two or three days and then very confused. They have deficits in attention and executive function, which means they have trouble completing tasks. A person who could button their shirt, put on their tie, put on their jacket and be ready to go now can't figure out how to make a tie work. They can't figure out how to do buttons even though they could do all of this yesterday. People with Lewy body have visual spatial problems. They fall. Everybody with dementia falls. It's part of the disease. They don't fall because falling's fun. They fall because the part of their brain that allows them to walk is gone. 
In dementia, as each brain cell dies, it's removed from the body. That's not what happens in normal aging. When you and I lose a brain cell, our body replaces it. Our brain makes a new one. In dementia, the brain can't make enough cells to keep up with the loss that's occurring. Does that make sense to everybody? Visual spatial function allows you to see yourself in space and time. What that means is if you walk up to a chair and pull a chair out and step in front of it, you know where you are in space and time in relation to the chair. That's how you're able to sit in the chair. A person with Lewy body pulls the chair out, moves to the side, and then tries to sit. So they miss the chair. People with Lewy bodies fall because they fall, and it's not related to anything. They're just walking and fall. They also scissor step. Scissor is, stepping is where you put one foot in front of the, as though you're going to come down normally, but then it crosses. And now there's a scissor, and the next step is going to be a fall. People with Lewy body fall because they faint, and the fainting's not related to blood pressure or medication. People with Lewy body fall because they lose consciousness. People with Lewy body have constipation that's not related to diet or medication. People with Lewy body sleep at night, wake up and have breakfast, and then have a two, four, six, eight, ten hour nap. And it's very difficult to rouse them from their nap. So all of the things that you see your loved one doing are the things that doctors need to hear. They need to know what you're seeing day to day so that they can make the best diagnosis possible as, you follow, as they follow your person. Vascular dementias mean that the dementia was somehow caused by the brain failing to get oxygen. Now, if you have been diagnosed with sleep apnea and you don't want to wear your sleep apnea machine because it, as the, the most common thing I hear is, I don't look sexy in it. I'm not sure where you're going in your sleep apnea machine that you need to be sexy. But you might want to think about putting it on because sleep apnea has now been marked as a causation or as, as a way to lead into vascular dementia because every time you stop breathing at night, your brain doesn't get oxygen. Does that make sense? Yeah. Smoking. If you're smoking, I, I realize it is the most addictive drug we know. It, nicotine is more addictive than heroin or meth. Nicotine is a rascal. And unlike every other drug we know, when you try to quit smoking, what do we tell you to do? Nobody here smokes, so y'all are good? We don't need to do this part? Yeah, we do. We do? Mm -hmm. What do they tell you when, you when you try to quit smoking? Just quit? What if you were trying to quit drinking? What would we all do? Run you to rehab. We'd run you to rehab. We'd get you a buddy. We'd hook you up with AA. What if you're trying to get off meth or heroin? We'd do the same thing, right? We'd get you to a hospital, we'd get you to a tra treatment place where you'd spend at least 30 days. With cigarettes, we just tell you to quit. It doesn't work very well. So if you're smoking, please find a way, talk to the doctor, quit smoking because every puff deprives your brain of oxygen. Benzwanger vascular dementia is where the vessel system leading into the brain wasn't large enough. And the cumulative effect over a few decades is this person develops Benzwanger vascular dementia. This dementia has a rapid onset, usually in the person's late 30s, early 40s, and death occurs within just a few years. Multi-infarct dementia is dementia caused by strokes, infarcts or strokes. Strokes are ischemic. That's where a clot breaks off, travels through the body, gets to a vessel in the brain that it's too large to go down, and so it stops blood flow to that area of the brain. Whatever memory, Whatever function, whatever behavior was in that area of the brain that didn't get blood flow, that area is now either damaged or has died. Hemorrhagic stroke we don't really deal with much because people don't generally survive hemorrhagic strokes. And the other stroke is a transient ischemic attack, a TIA. But TIAs don't sound dangerous because of their nicknames. TIAs are called tiny strokes. Tiny stroke doesn't sound bad. They're called mini strokes. Mini stroke kind of sounds cute, like a mini me. Baby stroke, baby stroke sounds like we ought to have a party for it and get it a little rattle. Pinpoint stroke, that doesn't sound bad at all. The cumulative effect of TIAs is eventually there is enough tissue damage that the person develops multi-infarct dementia. And if a person has multi-infarct dementia long enough, Alzheimer's will come in as well. This is called mixed dementia. 
And catacil is an inherited form of uh, vascular dementia where the blood vessels were the right size, but the walls of the blood vessels were too thick. And the cumulative effect is the person's brain didn't get enough oxygen. Onset of catacil is usually in the late 30s, early 40s, and death occurs in just a couple of years. Deep breath. Are you depressed yet? <laughs> Getting there? <coughs> well then let's go on. <laughs> Frontal temporal dementias are very challenging. The first two are the behavioral dementias. These are usually diagnosed because this person who's never been in trouble in their life gets picked up for shoplifting. They usually are shoplifting something pretty or something drinkable. This is not a criminal, this is not somebody who's done bad things, this is somebody who because of a lack of impulse control, because of damage in their brain, goes into a liquor store, picks up a bottle, drinks it, sets it down, goes to the next bottle, has a drink, sets it down. They get diagnosed as alcoholics, even though they had no, family, no um, history, personal history of having alcoholic behavior. They get picked up for shoplifting. They get fired for sexual innuendos or sexual behavior. Their social skills are deeply impaired. They tend to get too close to us. They get very, very close and then they say things that are uncomfortable, things that have a sexual component to them. So the first two are the behavioral ones. The next three are the communication disorders. PPA, semantic dementia, and logopenic varia. These dementias are determined by how the person stopped using words, how they stopped using language. Helps the doctor determine which one this is. The last four are the movement disorder dementias. These folks are generally going to be cared for in skilled care because skilled care has the equipment to lift and move people. If you need more information on FTDs, the website is www. Everybody gets a pen www.theaftd.org, which is the Association of Frontal Temporal Dementia.org. When you get on that website, you click on what is FTD, it will bring up the nine forms as well as their clinical features. And for those of you who are nurses or who are in buildings, they will also make a suggestion at the end of the uh, clinical component as to which medications have appeared to work best with these behaviors. Did everybody get that? There's a San Antonio chapter. <coughs> Yay. Okay. Y'all also have a Huntington's group down here as well. Okay. Now, do you believe people with dementia have depression? What do you think depression looks like? My grandpa Tamarkin. I'm sorry? Looks like my grandpa Tamarkin looked. <coughs> depressed. Just depressed? Sitting in a chair, head down, not engaging. Very quiet, withdrawn? Yes, and usually drunk. And usually drunk? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, hadn't thought about that yet, but. I'll, think, I'll give that some thought. People with dementia are more likely to have atypical depression. And atypical depression's features are not somebody sitting quietly in a dark room. Atypical depression's features are somebody who is angry, annoyed, agitated, and aggressive. That is not behavior that gets treated with behavior medication. That's behavior that is related to atypical depression, and it is treated with antidepressant medication. Everybody get that? People agitated and aggressive. So people with dementia have depression. The type of depression most common in people with dementia is the form called atypical depression. And the features of atypical depression are somebody who's angry, annoyed, agitated, and aggressive. Which pretty much describes my cab driver this morning. <laughs> now what is memory? For a lot of families, you were told that your loved one has dementia and they're going to lose their memory. But what is memory? Can you tell me what memory is without using the word memory? You remember? Your past history. Past history? Collection of thoughts. Collections of thoughts. Ability to recall. Ability to recall. 
Ability to recall and collection of thoughts are the top answers. Does that make sense to everybody? Y'all willing to go with that? Willing to stake anything on it? Just want this day to be over? <laughs> I hear you. Is sitting up in a chair memory? Is being able to hold your head above your shoulders memory? Do you know your grandparents' names? Is that memory? Do you know how to get home from here? Are you sure? <laughs> this, this table up here is a little confused. <laughs> do you know which car is yours? Or when you walk out in the parking lot, do you just click till something happens? <laughs> is that memory? Sometimes. How many of you have children that you'll admit to? <laughs> I know my mother's like, oh, for Pete's sakes. <laughs> How many parents? Do you have memories on each child? Where they were conceived, when they were born? Do you have more memories on one child than the other because you've had more phone calls on one child than the other? <laughs> Do you know your favorite restaurant? Best date you ever went on? Favorite movie? Do you know how to balance your checkbook? Or do you just operate that I still have a debit card and I've got checks so I must have money? <laughs> the Irma Bombeck method. Is that memory? Do you know how to cook? How to clean? How to bathe? How to dress? How to tie your shoes? How to brush your teeth? Is that memory? What if I said everything you do is memory? From sitting in a chair to knowing how to put on earrings to knowing that these are my glasses, to knowing how to tie a scarf, tie a shoe, start a car. How many of you know what three on the tree or four on the floor means? So you can drive a clutch. Everything you do is memory. Think about every memory as being a file. And remember, one of your kids, you've got a bigger file on that kid, because that's the one you got the phone calls on, right? How many of you were the kid that the phone calls came on? <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Now think about your brain as being the filing cabinet. Okay? Every memory is a file and your brain is the filing cabinet. In your moment of birth, who was the first person you met? Doctor. Nah, he passed you off. He didn't care. <laughs> Who'd you meet? Your mom. When your mom and dad left the hospital, where'd they take you? When you got home, who was there? The cat? Dog? Grandparents? Siblings? Nobody? You just grew up out in the woods by yourself, little feral child? You learn mom and dad, you learn family, you learn please and thank you, you learned your social skills, you learned your religious beliefs. You learned singing, you learned cussing, you learned bathing, dressing, grooming, tying shoes, ambulating, transferring, eating. And then they sent you to school. What did you learn in school? Not much in this group. <laughs> oh, now they pop up. Yeah, reading, writing, arithmetic. Do you remember playing new games at school? Tag? Do you remember when all you had to do to be happy was slap someone on the back, yell tag, and run? <laughs> Y'all want to go out in the parking lot and play tag? <laughs> what about Red Rover, Red Rover? Did you learn kickball, stickball, football, baseball, basketball? A lot of balls. Softball? Dodgeball? Which one? Hopscotch. Not one of the ball games, but yes, hopscotch. <laughs> Did you learn a musical instrument? New social groups? How many of you can remember your first love and your first kiss? Still waiting, this group? <laughs> you know there's a river walk here y'all can go to later. Might kind of catch up on some of that stuff. Then you got out of high school. Where did you go? College, went to work, joined the military, saw the world. Do you remember when you left home? Do you remember how happy mama was? <laughs> Gave you a box of food and a spatula and out the door you went. And as soon as you left, one of your siblings took your room. 
They changed the locks on the door and life was never the same after that. You got married, you had children. Who comes when the children are grown? The grandchildren. Who comes when the grandchildren are grown? No, they just keep coming. My mother, I, I have 12 nieces and nephews. My mother told them that they are procreating themselves right out of Christmas. Because <laughs> uh, number 12 great-grandchild is here, and number 13 and number 14 are on their way. Think about where you are right now. Do you live in San Antonio because this is where you've always lived? Did you move here for your job? Did you retire here? Did you move here to be closer to your children? And think about all of the things that have happened in the last 15 years. What was your first phone like? Did it fit in your pocket and had a camera and a video and you could watch TV or football on it and you could play music and... Do y'all know what cell phones are? <laughs> okay. What was your first phone? Bad phone. Suitcase. <laughs> Rotary. Did anybody do this? Or just this? Where was the phone in your house located? How long mama let you talk on that phone? About this long? Did your phone start with a number or did it start with a letter? How many of you know what a party line is? What about your first TV? Was it a 70 inch flat screen that hung on a wall and had 2,000 channels and no wires underneath it? Black and white. How big was it? How many channels did you get? Oh, y'all are rich people. See how that goes. We only got two because I lived in the country. What happened at midnight on your TV? What did it do right before it went off? National anthem, then a test pattern or a poem? How many channels do you get now? How many do you watch? We're not, we're not making a lot of progress in some of these areas, are we? What about a walker? Anybody see a walker growing up? No, walkers didn't exist. What about a cane? Did you see a cane when you were growing up? Yes. Who had the cane? Grandma. What'd you do with it? I said, made out of a broomstick, maybe. You know, someone that just... Uh-huh. What did you do with the cane? She's over here stabbing people. <laughs> Nobody did anything except this lady. All of the rest of y'all just left the cane sitting there. What'd you do with the cane? I wasn't allowed to touch it, are you kidding? I wonder why. <laughs> Usually they took the cane away when you hit baby or when you um, golfed with it. Hit, hit my brother. Hit, hit baby brother, you get in trouble for that, and they took the cane away. In dementia, most forms of dementia, memory is going to be removed in a reverse order. It's not that your loved one is trying to be difficult about rehab. It's that they don't understand rehab. They can't grasp that. They've never seen a walker before. And if you've ever had to use a walker, walkers are not easy to use. They require a lot of upper body strength. They require several coordinated steps together. And in later stages of dementia, people can't do that number of sequence steps that are required to make a walker work. It's not that they're trying to be difficult. It's that they don't understand. They don't have the brain tissue that's needed to be able to learn that. Now let me try another way to explain this. Let's say my mother has dementia. And my mother's file cabinet started in 1940. And it should go to 2015. But because of dementia, my mother thinks it's 1970. And in 1970, I'm 10 years old. So when I go to my mother and I say, I'm your daughter, what does she say? Why can't I be her daughter? Well, just don't even try to be subtle. Just go for it. <laughs> Carol, can you get that knife out of my back right back there, please? You know, usually people sort of hem and haw around that. I'm surprised here in San Antonio. This whole table over here went, too old. <laughs> I'm too old to be her daughter. She doesn't have files on me as an adult. So who does she think I am? 
I'm her sister, I'm her mother, I'm her grandmother, I'm her aunt, I'm her cousin. Did I mention my mother has 63 first cousins? It's a big family. I am somebody in this family. Most often I'm going to be the mother, the grandmother, the sister. We look like our family members. We move differently around a family member. We get in their personal space. For your loved one, you don't just do care from back here. You're very close to them doing care. You touch her, you fix her hair, you groom his mustache, you shave him, you comb him. They know that they know you, but they can't find a file on you. So they find a file on somebody who looks like you. Does that make sense? So sons, if it is the mother who is sick, the son may become her husband, and then her father or her grandfather. The daughter, if it's the father who's sick, may become the wife or the mother or the grandmother. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, dementias don't stop. They kill brain cells every moment of the day. They don't take the weekend off or holidays. It is constantly attacking the brain. As the disease continues, my mother doesn't remember being married, and if she wasn't married, she doesn't have children. So when I say to her, I am your daughter, what does she say? Who am I? I'm still the sister, the mother, the grandmother. She knows she knows me. She just can't find a file on me because the file has been destroyed. The disease continues. It doesn't take the weekend off. It doesn't stop at midnight. It continues to kill cells. Where does everybody with dementia want to go? And who are they looking for? And are mom and dad still here? Most of the time they're not. And I say this because a couple of months ago I was in a community and a uh, woman in her 70s came up and said, have you seen my mother? And I said what I would normally say, which is no, but I'm sure she'll be here shortly. And the woman said okay and walked off and the nurse leaned over and said her 93-year-old mother comes every day for lunch and will be here in about, oh, seven minutes. <laughs> so every now and then there really is a mom. Now when they talk about wanting to go home, do they mean home where they raise their children? What home are they looking for? How many of you gave up and drove them out to that place so that they would stop talking? And when you got there, did they tell you that's not it? You're in the wrong place, this isn't the right thing? Home is actually something inside. When you worry about how do I make a memory care community feel like home, home is the pillow you sleep on. Do you sleep on a feather pillow? A foam pillow? Is your pillow soft or medium or is it firm? What kind of sheets do you sleep on? Do you sleep on cotton, linen? Do you like your sheets starched, ironed? Do you sleep on sateen? I'm always afraid I'm going to hit that sateen bed and just go slithering right on out the other <laughs> side. And that's where they will find me, naked on the balcony, hanging by. <laughs> you didn't get a visual then, did you? Okay, just take that out. Do you sleep on sheets that are white, gray, red, patterned, covered with flowers? How many of you still have your Spider-Man sheets? <laughs> and what's on your bed? What do you cover up with? Home is that quilt from your grandmother. Home is that chair you sit in. Home is the art on your walls. That's what makes your house different than mine. Home is the pictures of your family. That's what home is. Okay, so in normal progression, we develop from infancy to adulthood. In normal aging, we continue to add files. We continue to learn. In dementia, the disease is going to remove memory in a reverse order. The Alzheimer retrogenesis scale goes from adulthood to infancy. Does that make sense? Okay. Now these are the lobes of the brain. And the way we track the disease is each of these lobes is responsible for you being able to do certain behaviors or have certain memory. And when you stop those behaviors or stop having that memory, it tells us that the disease must now be in that lobe for you to behave that way. Does that make sense to everybody? 
Does that make sense to anybody other than this table? Okay. Everybody's with me. But for you to make memory, for you to learn something, the hippocampus must function. Hippocampus is Greek for seahorse because the little green thing looks like a seahorse. You see it? Kind of turn your head to the side. So you see, see the seahorse? Yeah. See him better there? Yeah. There. Here or here? You like the green one, you like the pink one. Everybody knows the seahorse has the eyeball, right? You know which one's the seahorse? Okay. For you to learn information, this must not only be in place, this must be functioning. Information around you is scanned by the hippocampus, and it decides whether you need that information for a few seconds, for a few minutes, whether you need it for uh, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, a few minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, a day, a week, a month, or a lifetime. Think about when you leave here today and you get back up on an interstate. Your hippocampus is reviewing all the information being given to it. It's telling you to watch out for that blue car. That truck's coming up too fast. That guy's changing lanes. Is that girl texting? Oh my God, cop, 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 cop. <laughs> and then you're to your exit. You get through the red light, hopefully the stop sign. Then you get home. And when you get home, you don't remember, did I stop at the red light? Did you? Do you remember the blue car? The girl texting? The big truck? Now, if the cop is always there, your hippocampus will figure out this is where the cop sits, so drive slow here. But otherwise, your hippocampus said you don't need any of that information. It's not needed. How many of you know my name? It's kind of sad because they introduced me, and um, it's been on every slide you looked at, and it's in the folder some of you have open. But the reality is your hippocampus looked at me this morning and said, never going to see her again. Don't even need to know that name. That's different than if when you get home today, your daughter calls to tell you she's pregnant. It's triplets. They're due on Thanksgiving, and she's going to name them Huey, Dewey, and Louie. <laughs> that your hippocampus sits up and takes note of. It begins to make a file because that's information you need for a lifetime. That's much different than the girl in the blue car who's texting. Does that make sense? In most forms of dementia, the disease starts in the ideal cells just below the hippocampus. It moves into the hippocampus and it begins to destroy the hippocampus. Okay? And this causes amnesia. This is true amnesia. Amnesia is the inability to use and understand short-term or long-term memory. Tell me the doctor's appointments at three. Okay. Now, remember, people with dementia don't look sick until the very end of the disease. So I look at her and I say, okay. And she thinks, I made eye contact, I ask a clear question, I said okay, and I don't look sick. And then a few minutes later, when's the doctor's appointment? It's at three. Okay. Her eyebrows are going up more than they, while ago they were low, now they're getting high. And then a few minutes later, I say, now, when's the doctor's appointment? At three. I already told you. Yeah, that's my caregiver right there. <laughs> <laughs> because the reality is, after about three times, you are certain I'm doing this just to annoy you. You are certain that I'm doing this just to get you back because 50 years ago you came in late one day as a teenager and I've been waiting all this time to destroy your life. And then a few minutes later I say, now when's the doctor's appointment? Oh, look at her back over there. She's ready to throw down. So she says to me, I've already told you when the doctor's appointment is, and I say, no, you didn't. And she said, well, yes, I did. And I say, no, you didn't. If you told me, I would know. Because my brain says everything is still fine. And she's thinking, well, you're just doing this just to bother me. And the reality is, it's funny in here, but 9,000 times a day of being asked, why haven't you fed me? How come I didn't get to go to the party? Why doesn't my son ever visit? How come I haven't eaten today? When is the doctor's appointment? 
The reality is, you've told me 50 times when the doctor's appointment is, my plate is sitting right here where I've eaten, my son just left, and the party was at my house. It's just that my hippocampus is damaged, and I can't learn that information. I'm now operating off old information. But I don't look sick. Everybody got that? Yes. The disease continues and it moves into the temporal lobes. And the temporal lobes are hearing, language, smell, memory, facial recognition. This side is formal language. It's social language. You have a whole conversation over here. You did it when you got here today. You sat down at the table, you looked at the person next to you, and you said what? You're in my chair? <laughs> You said, hi, how are you? And what do you automatically say back? And why do you say fine? Because mama taught you a long time ago that nobody cares. <laughs> you could come in with your leg hanging by a sinew and I could say, hi, how are you? And you would say, oh, I'm fine, how are you? I'm pretty good. Um, how about this weather? Oh, it's fine. How's your family? Oh, they're fine. How you feeling? Oh, I'm fine. You've been taught all your life to have this conversation. You've had it a million times. And just because you have dementia doesn't mean you're not continuing to have that conversation. People on the outside think that you actually understand that conversation. Siblings who live out of state or live in another town who don't understand how sick your loved one is. Children who are in denial about what their parent is dealing with. All of these things come together because the person doesn't look sick yet because they can still have this social conversation. So this side is formal language, this side is singing, cussing, and yes, no. You were hearing singing before you were born. You learned cussing when you were very young. And every person in here knows the same words. Except for me, I worked with severely emotionally disturbed teenage boys, so I do know a few words y'all don't know. <laughs> And for a small fee, I will meet you in the hallway and share those words with you. <laughs> but the reality is we all know these words. It's just part of our socialization is we don't use them. So when your mother, who never missed a day of church, who you never heard say a curse word, suddenly calls caregivers names and curses at the staff, it can make you think that God doesn't love her anymore or she's going to hell or she really appreciates what she's saying. And then right after she curses at people, she hears them doing church and she can sing all the words to Amazing Grace. And you think if she can cuss and she can sing, she understands what she's doing, plus she doesn't look sick yet. And the reality is, this side dies first. When I can no longer say, leave me alone, I'm having a bad day, you're talking too fast, I don't understand your accent, you're asking me to do something I can't remember all the steps for. This is embarrassing to me. When I can't say those words anymore, I got a whole bunch of words over here that will make you leave me alone. And then I'll sing Amazing Grace. Okay? So in most people, when cursing begins, it is an indicator to you that this side dies first. Okay? The staff does not take anything personally. And for family members, I realize how hard this is you can't take it personally. This is no longer that person you knew and loved. This is that person you knew and loved with dementia. Okay? The disease continues in the temporal lobes until the person develops aphasia. Aphasia is the inability to use and understand language. In the beginning, the person can use all their words. By the end of the disease, there's no language left. But 75% of our communication is done without language. It's body language that we read. It's the pitch and tone of your voice. It is the way we laugh with one another. A person with dementia may have no language skills, but you can still tell if you're being laughed at or laughed with. They can still understand your tone of voice. The same skills that you used as a new parent when you brought home a child and nobody had given you a book on what to do, Within 24 hours of being a new parent, you learn that that cry means I need to be fed, and that cry means I want to be held, that cry means I need to be changed, that cry means my big brother's in here, he told me he didn't want me coming home anyway, and he's getting rid of me, and he's starting right now. <laughs> we have an ability to engage with people even when language skills are lost. The disease continues, it moves into the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes are what make you, you, and me, me. 
This is my family, my education, rational thought, impulse control, judgment, imagination. Impulse control is what stops you from doing and saying every little mean thing you've thought today. If you really want to know, does this dress make me look fat, go to a dementia community and ask the ladies. <laughs> if you want to know if your haircut is styling, go to a dementia community and ask the ladies. If you're very brave and want to know if your child is ugly, <laughs> take that baby to a dementia community and ask the ladies and they will tell you that is an ugly baby. <laughs> they're not doing it to be mean, they're doing it because there's no more impulse control. I was in a community once in Washington and a lady was knitting, actually she was tatting. Do you know tatting? Much more difficult. She was using plastic needles, which should have been my first clue. And I said to her, look at you, you're tatting, that is beautiful. And she said, oh, thank you, honey, but they took away my needles, gave me these stupid plastic ones. I'm 94, you'd think I could use a needle. I said, oh my goodness, you're 94. She said, yes, honey, I'm 94. I said, well, you know, you don't look 94, you look more like 74. She said, oh, thank you, honey, but I'm 94. And I said, well, you know, I myself am only 29. And she said, oh, honey, you don't look good. <laughs> if they think it, they will say it. It is not being mean. It is that lack of impulse control. Okay? The disease continues. It moves into the occipital lobes. The occipital lobes are the ones at the back of your skull. It's what translates visually for you. It's not your glasses. Glasses make a muscle in my eye constrict. It just makes things come into focus. This tells me the difference. I know, for example, that this is a table and this is a chair. I have tables and chairs at home, but they don't look like this, but this is a table and chair. I know that this is Carol because I know Carol. Carol is in my facial recognition, in my frontal lobe, my temporal lobe, my occipital lobe. I can see things three-dimensionally. People with dementia tend to be bruised from their shoulder to their kneecaps because they walk into tables and chairs and hallways and doorknobs and people because they can't see. As the disease moves into the frontal and the occipital lobes, we now see agnosia, the inability to use and understand common objects or people. The people component is that now they're beginning to have trouble recognizing their family members because facial recognition is in the three lobes that are now infected. Agnosia is the inability to use common objects. You send someone to brush their teeth and they come out with a hairbrush. How is a hairbrush similar to a toothbrush? They both say brush. Both have handles, both have bristles. Where do you find them? Where do you use them on your body? Same, same area. You need someone to sign a legal document. Document. They insist on a pencil. Well, pencils like a pen. They make marks. They're long. You hold them. One makes a permanent mark and one does not. In the beginning, you learned eating. You learned to eat with your hands, then a spoon, then a fork, then a fork and a knife. In Alzheimer's retrogenesis scale, the person will go from a fork and a knife to a fork to a spoon, to finger foods. This is agnosia, the inability to use common objects or recognize people. The disease continues, it moves into the parietal lobes, and the parietal lobes are pain, touch, taste, and temperature. People with dementia may or may not feel pain. The most common break that occurs is that the person stands at the table and goes to turn, and this didn't turn right. So the bone actually fractures. Because of an inability to perceive pain, this person may walk around on this fractured bone for a few hours or even a few days until the bone fractures enough to cause the fall. Families think that the impact with the floor broke the bone, but the bone actually broke when the person stood. For family caregivers, broken bones are a sign to you that the brain is now so damaged it can no longer maintain the skeletal structure of the body. People with dementia have an ability to feel touch. Tactile sensation works until the very end of life. That's why 
End-of-life care involves a lot of massage, a lot of aromatherapy, a lot of touch. And touch is very important to people with dementia. They are the least touched group in our population. As you grew up, when you were a child, you were held. You were held by everybody until you got to be about six, and then you started getting pushed off people's laps because you were too big. But it was okay because you had friends. That's why everybody gets sick in first grade. Then you got a boyfriend or a girlfriend, then you got married, you were with somebody for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, and now that person is gone. The kids aren't around, the grandkids aren't around, there's less and less touch, and as people get dementia, there's even less touch. But at the end of uh, the disease process, touch remains the one thing we can continue to give to this person. People with dementia have a different body temperature than you and I do. They are typically colder than you and I because their normal body temperature is 95 to 97 degrees. That means when you've looked at your loved one and you've said, you know they don't feel good, I can tell they don't feel good. It's usually something in their eyes. You know they don't feel good. But you take their temperature and it's 98.6. That in a person with dementia is the equivalent of 100 degrees to you and me. So you have to take your loved one's temperature at the first of each month to determine what their baseline is and anticipate it will be between 95 and 97 degrees. And remember, 93 degrees is death. People with dementia are left with the ability to taste what? Sweets. I asked a lady once, she said, um, she was talking about her husband, and I said, well, has he, does, he, does he like sweet foods? And she said, oh, he tried. He tries to eat the sweet food. I won't let him. I said, has he lost weight? And she said, well, about 40 pounds. There comes a point in time for every family where you decide, is the pie more important than the carrots? Are the calories more important than what they came in? And these are decisions that families have to make. When you go to visit your loved one and you think there's nothing left for me to do, there's nothing to do when I'm there, bring them pie. Bring them a donut. If you bring a donut, you better bring enough for everybody because they can smell donuts. <coughs> Come and have your donut. Bring kisses. Bring Hershey's. Hershey's is the first chocolate most people in our country ever had. That memory stays. Come and have candy, come and have a cookie, have a donut, have pie, have cake. Share that with your person and then go. Does that make sense? Everybody okay? Okay, we, uh, as the disease moves into the parietal lobes, it causes apraxia. And apraxia is the inability to have coordinated and purposeful muscle movement. Coordinated and purposeful muscle movement is everything from being able to stand being able to hold your head erect above your shoulders. Late stage dementia people can't hold their head up. It's not because that feels good sitting like this all day. It's because their brain can no longer tell their body how to hold the head erect. Apraxia at the end means the ability to chew and swallow food. Most people with dementia end up aspirating food into their lungs and from there they develop pneumonia. That is apraxia. Deep breath. We've given you a staging tool and you're, free, you're happy to have you download it off of our website. The staging tool is designed for you to be able to look at your person, check off the behaviors that you're seeing, and know what stage of the disease they're in. Today, as you leave here or when you get back home, sit and look at your person and try to be as critical as you can. Meaning that for family members, I usually grade much harder on this scale than you do because I don't have the emotional attachment. Does that make sense? Okay, so look at the stages and I can tell you that because you're here, family members, you're probably, your person is probably somewhere in four, five, six, or seven because most people have not begun to reach out in the earlier stages. Family members for stage two, you're going to look at stage two and you're going to think, oh crap, I've got it too. Because stage two says things like you forget names. <laughs> stage two says things like you lose stuff. How many of you have lost your keys? When you found the keys, did you know what they went to? Yeah. You're fine. How many of you have lost your cell phone? You had to get another phone, call your cell phone before somebody else got your cell phone or your cell phone died and you lose your cell phone? <laughs> cell phones were supposed to make your life easier. Did that work for anybody? 
<laughs> okay. Stage two is only a concern if you're seeing that these things are multiple during the day, that this is a continual process. Stage three is the word dementia for the first time. Stage four is the middle of dementia. And stages five, six, and seven are the late stages. Look on the tool, determine where your person is, date it, put the tool up, and don't look again until February. Look at the tool every three months to see where your person is, and that will give you an idea of what's coming next, and it will give you an idea of financially how to prepare. Unfortunately, okay? I have to stop. I'm done. Thank y'all. Time is everything. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the last thing she said was about the staging tool. Can you find it on her website? Can, can she give us that again, please? If she had I, it should be on your tool. Well, okay. Yeah. I've got this. Is, is there a website? At the bottom of the tool, it says tamcummings.com. Tamcummings.com. We'll get it to you. Okay. We'll, we'll send the helper to your table. <laughs> we, we have a Christmas elf. <laughs>